Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Herb LeBallon Lecture Series. My name is Alexander. I am one of the instructors in the Typic Cooper uh, program, uh, and it's my honor and privilege to, to invite you to another lecture um, in the spring edition of the Herb LeBallon Lecture Series. So for those not familiar with Typic Cooper, Typic Cooper is a postgraduate certificate program in typeface design. Um, it is also um, uh, a series of lectures, which um, are um, part of the curriculum in, in the program, in the extended program. But the uh, Typic Cooper also offers a lot of workshops on typography, calligraphy, lettering, um, any um, in all uh, letter related uh, fields. And um, one of the newest um, expansions of the Typic Cooper program is um, a series of workshops dedicated to information design. So for those interested in info design, uh, infographics and, and data visualizations, check out some of the lectures um, and the um, workshops in that. So, um, uh, the lectures are um, part of the Typic Cooper program and the Typic Cooper program, along with Herb LeBallon Study Center uh, and Cooper Union are um, the uh, presenters of, of this. Um, I also wanted to, to give a, a quick uh, thank you to Type Culture for allowing us to um, record and archive the, um, all of these wonderful videos that we have, all, all these amazing lectures that we have, and, and add them to our um, archives. So for those who are not familiar with Type Culture, uh, Type Culture is its uh, independent uh, type foundry, digital type foundry. And, an, and a really wonderful academic resource run by uh, Mark Jammer. So thanks to Mark and his generosity of uh, type culture for allowing us to continue expanding um, this, this set of um, uh, educational materials. Um, the archive of lectures, I'm going to try to do my usual multitasking um, and, and post the links to you for you all uh, to be able to see. We have a very, very large archive, as I mentioned, going back several years, about nine years thereabouts, about 80, 80 videos. So a wonderful, wonderful collection of, of, of things free to watch. If you go to both of these links that you see on the screen and in the chat, you can find uh, past, past recordings. Um, I wanted to also kind of um, do a, a quick housekeeping note about um, Q&A, um, so save questions for, for Amelia, our presenter today, um, for the end of the presentation, we'll take some questions in there, so use the Q&A function. And then in the chat, um, there is a kind of a toggle between uh, messaging the, the panelists, kind of the, the folks behind the scenes making this event possible, and then everyone, which obviously is um, messaging to everybody watching the, the event. So if you have a note for the back of the house, um, use the host and panelists if you want to um, chat to basically everybody watching make sure to toggle to everyone i also wanted to mention two more lectures that we have coming up in the spring uh, edition of, of the lectures so this uh coming thursday this week um in person and uh we'll be live stream that over youtube ellen lupton will be here with us um giving a talk um at 6.30, uh, called Living with Type. Um, she'll be presenting a new expanded third edition of Thinking with Type um, and giving us a, a little bit of a personal story about typography and, and the teaching of it. And then on um, the uh, Thursday, April 4th, also at 6.30, we'll have a talk by Ryan Buckton um, called Semi-Complete, the process behind RISD Serif and RISD Sands, the two typefaces that were uh, designed um, by Ryan for RISD's new uh, expanded typographic palette. So check out those two and you can see um, uh, registration uh, to those uh, links in uh, going uh, to the link. You can snap a picture of the QR code or just go to coopertype.org lectures. You'll see the two lectures. You can click and register there. You can register to, to, to get the link to watch it or register to attend them in person. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's uh, presentation. Um, the, the lecture titled Le Graphisme uh, chez Duberny et Peignot. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, the presenter of this talk, Amelia Fontanel, who will speak about um, the Foundry and the highly influential magazine Arsimetia Graphique, published from 1927 to 1939. 
Um, our presenter today, Amelia Fontanel, is a curator at the Rochester Institute of Technology's Cary Graphic Arts Collection, which is, for those not familiar with it, a renowned library that collects design, typography, and the book arts. She recently curated the show The Sculptures of George Giusti at the Cary, uh, who is one of my favorite mid-century designers, maybe lesser known, but should definitely be better known, and um, Cary's is, is lucky to have uh, quite a bit of George's work. Um, it's kind of one of these lesser known, but really wonderful, eclectic mid-century designers. Amelia is an art historian and editor who contributes to numerous publications, including those about graphic design, calligraphy, uh, wood type, and type founding. As manager of Carrie's technology collection, she is responsible for teaching and maintaining vintage presses, thousands of fonts of type. She's actively involved in the letterpress community, holding past board and executive positions with the American Printing History Association and the Hamilton Wood Type and Printing Museum. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Amelia to share her research and insight into this amazingly fascinating artifact uh, that tells a very rich uh, history of typography. So take it away, Amelia. Thank you very much. All right, my friends, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm just over the moon to be here today. Of course, uh, I'm Amelia Fontanelle, and I'm a curator at the Cary Graphic Arts Collection at RIT. Now, Cary is RIT's rare book library, and among many things having to do with graphic design, we specialize in materials about type design and typography. So, as an illustration of the breadth of our collections, I just want to show two things here. One, an early type specimen by Gian Battista Bodoni from his Manuale Typografico from 1788, printed in Parma on a hand press with handmade paper. And of course, uh, Bodoni was the punch cutter and designer for just so many different typefaces in different sizes and for different languages and scripts. It really illustrates the virtuosity of what is possible in type design and fine printing. And so this is something that, an artifact that we pull out regularly for our students at RIT and scholars who visit. Along with our paper-based collections, Carrie is fairly unique in uh, the typographic libraries in that we also collect letterpress typographic realia or printing presses and type. So last count, we have about 30 working printing presses and about 2000 uh, typefaces in metal and wood type. And that's actually my primary role as a master printer and collections manager. I do demonstrations and workshops with this material and also teach a credit bearing letterpress class. The type I'm showing here is very, fairly rare. It's Frederick Gowdy's new style type. It's among the types that were lost or uh, perished in the fire in his studio in 1939. But today I'm going to veer off and talk about a very specific slice of design and typographic history originating in France in the era between the two world wars. So the 1920s and the 30s. And the title of the talk is Le Graphisme chez Deberny et Pagnon, or Graphic Design at Deberny and Pagnon, which was a Parisian type foundry. For context, this period was such a fertile time for new expressions and art thinking. If you look at the major European movements, France was at the center of many of them. From early on, on the left there, including Impressionism and Art Nouveau and Fauvism, to the period we're going to be looking at um, with the art movements of Cubism and Dada and Surrealism. Bubbling up in Paris during this era, a magazine called Arts et Métiers et Graphique was published in 68 issues. The title translates to Graphic Arts and Trades. It documented any topic about design, printing, photography, and all of these are disciplines influenced certainly by those major art movements. This arsimétier graphique was actually a house organ, or as people formally like to define that, a periodical distributed by a business among its employees or its sales personnel or its customers. 
The Arsimétie Graphique was published by the largest type foundry in the time in France called De Bernier and Pagnon. This is a huge two volume specimen with the first volume showing printing equipment for letterpress printing and the second advertising their types. The caption at the bottom of this section divider says that they had 7,500 drawers of matrices in their factory for a total of about 700,000 sorts that they could cast. The foundry's president, Charles Pagnon, had the vision to launch the magazine. He went on to be a very important figure in the annals of type design, and we still experience his legacy today in the field. But let's get a little historical background. Type foundries of the past, and even as we have noticed, I'm sure, in the present, are famous for merging. This was the case for the two leading French foundries that had roots in the 19th century, Pagnot et Fils, or Pagnot and Sons, and another firm called Laurent et de Berny. The two firms merged in 1923, creating a mega foundry with two factories. And here, we can see the lineage of the foundry going all the way back to the 19th century, where they trace their roots to the very famous writer Honoré de Balzac, who dabbled in owning a type foundry for a time. And he is on the left at the top there. And then to Charles Pagnot, where our story begins, at the bottom there on the right image. So the de Berny Foundry brought assets in matrices for a lot of classic text faces in reading sizes, as well as many Dido-esque typefaces. On the, on the right there, we see such uh, contrasty modern Roman typefaces with those just super fine, precise hairline serifs. But I could not resist including this page of various variety letters too, indicative of the fancy and overly ornamental typography of the 19th century. On con in contrast, the Pagnot firm brought more contemporary successes in type design for Art Nouveau typefaces like this one, Grasset, inspired by the lettering of the Swiss graphic artist Eugène Grasset. And I just want to read to you the, the title of this type specimen pamphlet, the foundry of Georges Pagnot et Fils is sending you this specimen to present its character glacé, designed or drawn by the master and engraved with care. This is another popular Pagnot face. Um, this is Ariel by the illustrator Georges Ariel, which is the type that was adopted by the early Paris Metro signage. I particularly enjoy the champ levé or enameled chromatic version issued in two colors on the right. Now, right after the De Bernier and Peño merger in 1925, a groundbreaking trade fair took place in Paris that codified an international art movement. It was called the Exposition des Arts Décoratives et Industrielles Modernes, or the Exhibition of Modern, Industrial, and Decorative Art. It was a huge affair, and it was marked by this 12-volume guide that documented all the exhibitors of the event. Art Décoratif was later commonly abbreviated, as we know it, as Art Deco. Now, in terms of the Art Deco style, the organic forms, floriated masses, and snaking tendrils of the previous popular style called Art Nouveau had become so baroquely profuse that the pure beauty of that original style was choked by the 1920s, where our story begins. Art Deco replaced these eccentricities with new symbols of power and progression, like the lightning bolt and the chevron. So these rectilinear motifs could be seen in all things at the exposition, the buildings, the furniture, the packaging, advertisements, Art Deco design trend spread to many consumable items, not the least of which was, of course, Art Deco type. And I always pause on that third point, bullet point there and think about how many millions of people they estimate saw this exposition with this new style that really became an international movement. 
I show the Chrysler building here because it's one of the most recognizable examples of American Art Deco with its stylized gleaming chrome sunbursts at the top. But back in France, Charles Pagnot was shrewd and he knew that his type foundry should start issuing types that espouse this new Art Deco aesthetic. So one of the exhibitors at the fair was a poster illustrator whose name was A.M. Cassandra whose poster for Le Boucheron Furniture won a prize at the fair. Pignot saw this and commissioned Cassandra to design a metal typeface for De Bernier and Pignot. And I'm gonna come back to that, the result of that collaboration as it ties directly into the Ostimité Graphique magazine. Charles Pignot's next big project was to publish a journal, which he had hoped, and I quote from him, to be the most interesting and luxurious art, mu art magazine in the world. That's very ambitious to say the least, but Pagnot assembled an editorial and creative team, which delivered issues of Arsimete Graphique six times a year. So this is the first issue from 1927, and I wanted to give you a taste for the how big it is, about 70 pages. It also includes, in addition to uh, articles, many very interesting examples and samples of printing, so tipped in. This one happens to be a photograph that is not the typical paper. It was reporting on uh, different types in Italy in this article. And then it goes on to kind of jump to the history. This is the civilité typeface from France, reporting on German typography and what was being released in fine press books or the illustrators of books. One of the areas that I always like to look at is the end of Artimétie Graphique because it specifically started to analyze publications of advertisements. This is an article about what Americans would see in their ad, their magazines for ads. And then the ads and the notices about what was going on in Paris during that time. So in all the issues, AMG, as I'll call it, to abbreviate it, reported on new typefaces that came on the market, especially in advertising De Bernier and Pagnot's new typefaces. And much like design reporting that we're all familiar with today, like in the Graphis Annual or online news outlets like AIGA, Ion Design, they offered their readers tabs on what was current and made commentary as arbiters of taste. So each issue also included long format illustrated articles on trends in the graphic arts, including things like the book and printing history, who were the, the best illustrators of the time period. Uh, there was a regular article on collecting books. My favorite, because I'm interested in printing processes, graphic art techniques. So all different examples of what was new and current in printing. And then as I'll talk about in a minute, photography and advertising design, which were very important themes. And of course, what linked all the issues was that every single article and advertisement was set in a Deberny and Peño typeface. So it was this subtle 70 page advertisement for the type foundry. And here we could see uh, the typeface Nicholas Koshan as the heading and the text face and then the uh, typeface Sphinx on an advertisement here. But let's continue this exploration of innovative typography. First off, AMG deb debuted the newest typefaces from the foundry. This is the landmark collaboration between AM Cassandra and Charles Pagnot to create Le Bifur, or Bifur, the quintessential Art Deco typeface. Think of the shiny geometry of the Chrysler building this dazzling specimen is printed on metallic paper and accompanied by a kind of design manifesto by Cassandra in the magazine. Cassandra wrote, Pfeiffer was conceived like an electric shock or a motor explosion to fill a specific purpose, not for decoration. 
The cutting of this typeface was indeed a tour de force as each letter is split or bifurcated by extremes in weight, in finely machined lines, and thick stylized geometric strokes. I just want to show the alternate chromatic bifur design where the fine lines were replaced by color blocks of whatever color the printer chose. This specimen relates directly back to my library, the Carey, as our namesake, Melbert B. Carey Jr., imported metal types from De Bernie and Pagnot for the American market. This is the main reason why the Carey Collection's De Bernie and Pagnot holdings are so strong. Now, remembering back to the typography, remembering that most of the text in the magazine was foundry type, so it was set by hand. These layouts in circles or curves are particularly masterful, showing off what's possible with an expert typesetter who could break with rectilinear typesetting. This next piece is an amazing example of a typographic picture. It illustrates an article appreciating ancient Greek architecture. The three weights of the Futura typeface were set to create the illusion of a convex shadow of the rounded column. Now, incidentally, De Bernie and Pagnot licensed the future uh, typeface from the German Bauer type foundry, and they sold it to the French market as a type called Europe. So they still are using technically a De Bernie face. Along with expressive typesetting like this, several reproductions of the latest samples of full color printing were bound into each issue like this vivid rainbow poster designed by the Russian designer, Alexei Brodovich. He lived in Paris for a time. Now we Americans know Brodovich as the innovative art director for fashion magazines like Harper's Bazaar, which he did in the 30s through the 50s. Let's talk about special issues. This is special issue number 59, and it was dedicated to the Paris World's Fair that was held from May to November, 1937. The official title was the International Exhibition of Arts and Techniques Applied to Modern Life. And De Bernie and Pagnot again took the opportunity to launch its new typeface in this issue, which is also that typeface happened to be the official type for all the text in the French pavilions at the fair. Can we guess what the typeface was? It was Le Pagnot, designed again by A.M. Cassandra, uh, this article included a preface by Charles Pagnot about how revolutionary Pagnot the typeface was. I'll quote from him. We present today to the public an alphabet where the essential characteristic is conceived differently from the multitude of other characters that came before. It is through a profound study on the evolution of letter forms across centuries that we have acquired the certainty that the principle of this evolution is pursued logically. He goes on, the scribes took 10 centuries to deform the Roman cap capitals. The print shop took five centuries to influence the fundamental form of the letters. And essentially his and Cassandra's logic was to almost abandon the traditional forms of the Latin lowercase alphabet. Looking at that, we can see the lowercase g and h and many of the other ones maintaining the form of their caps. There are only deviations in the article they, they justified. Those deviations would preserve readability as in the lowercase i and the j that you see here. Now the documentary photographs of the fair are so informative in this issue. On the left is an exhibit in the fair showing how they conceived the Peño typeface, drawing from all those historical, inscriptional, calligraphic, and typographical precedents. Also, the AMG issue is set entirely in Peño. They were trying really hard, really hard, to demonstrate how it could be used in text sizes. But I think the need for it to be leaded wide for optimal readability contributed to them backtracking a bit. And this backtracking happened after the war and they reworked the Peño typeface to include the old forms of the lowercase in a typeface later called Torren. And we're seeing the post-war type specimen 
reworking Peño. But I digress in the typographic weeds, which I love to do anyway. Al Cimite Grafique was also on the forefront of documenting two very important trends in the early 20th century. Those trends were the predominance of photography in the graphic arts and the rise of a newly formalized field of advertising. So let's look at some other special issues. This is the forecasting issue for photography 1931, which was a medium as a medium was supplanting illustration for its veracity, especially in news outlets, but also it was being explored as a true art form. So photography, the Arts and Metagraphique 16, dispensed with all the regular columns. There's only one article in this issue and instead included a documentation of the state of photography with all different kinds of photographs presented spanning fashion and portraiture here in this spread with artists who would go on to attain a kind of star status in the history of photography, like Andre Cortege and Germaine Krull, or other spreads that explored surrealist art photos from Man Ray and Jean Morel. This has such sumptuous negative space in the layout. And if you look at the truncated doll hand and that mechanical spring on the left side, paired with a very organic and soft human and bird forms. Or perhaps this fantastic contrast in shiny advertising photography of that gleaming wheel paired with the eerie tonal reversal of a solarized landscape. I also have to mention that this issue of Alcimente Graphique was printed with the rotogravure process, which was at the pinnacle of high resolution printing for photographs that letterpress couldn't achieve in halftone. There's a high dynamic range as in the intaglio printing. It captures detail in the lightest whites areas of the images and the darkest black uh, tonal fields. And there's a reason why I, I bring this, photo, this uh, journal out often to show our photography classes at RIT because the reproduction value is so high. Debrunet and Peignot, the type foundry, even offered a photographic halftone plate making service, diversifying like a smart business to capture this photographic need. This is a chapter divider page where in their pre-war specimen, it includes a stereotype flong, which is a plate making tool and in the upper left are examples of halftone ad flongs for photograph reproduction. Now skipping to the future of the magazine a bit, issue number 42 from 1934 solely spotlighted innovative advertising campaigns. Let's look at this cover made of industrial translucent plastic. I absolutely guarantee there was nothing like it on the newsstands that month. But not only that, you know, the editors of this magazine elevated everyday packaging, posters, and print advertising to be valued for their designs. So something as ephemeral as a cigarette box was praised for its efficacy in attracting new markets like women as smokers. This article, uh, they are stating and analyzing the sales data from 1927 and 1932 for the French cigarette brand Galois. And they attributed record sales partially to the attractiveness of the packaging. That sounds pretty familiar to us in the 21st century designing ads too, where we use design to advertise the product and then use the sales data to gauge the effectiveness. So these techniques were being refined 90 years ago in this publication. And of course, as the owner of the magazine, Debernay and Pagnot made sure to advertise their products alongside the reportage. The cruise liner travel posters of the Cherbourg on the left are paired with a glamorous starlet hawking the display tape typeface film by Marcel Jacquinot. This ad also reinforces the power of photography to elevate the cachet of lowly printer's type, right? As a historian, I think one of the values of the reporting on advertising in Arsimetia Graphique is the documentary Street View photos, 
where we can see how people of the time were interacting with the now iconic posters and advertisements. The unique shoe posters there were designed by our old friend A.M. Cassandra, but now at auction, these posters fetch thousands of dollars. They're so collectible, but they were just part of the everyday hustle of Parisian life. So the final topic I will feature in Asimete Graphique is type piracy. Charles Pignot was outraged by it, and he took the platform of his magazine to call out unauthorized copies of his typefaces. This is an article by uh, the famous typographic commentator, Maximilian Vox, on the influences and unauthorized copies of Bifer, the typeface. He sums up in the end how the innovative design had been often plagiarized, and I'll quote from Vox, where an inexpert hand led by an eye without clairvoyance attempts to match the work of years of research and arduous development. Two subdivisions to note, pure and simple plagiarism and imbecile or stupid plagiarism, where Bifer is corrected and amended. In 1930, we hear directly from Charles Pagnon himself in this article, uh, Plea for the Legal Protection of Printing Type. He gets very legal and technical, and I'll quote, referring to the penal code I found in Article 425, which defines counterfeiting, any addition of writings, musical composition, drawing, painting, or any other production, printed or engraved in whole or in part, in defiance of the laws and regulations relating to artistic property of the authors. It would seem upon reading this text that the character of printing should be protected by law. And in the same way as literature, music, painting, and other arts, because the character is in short, only an engraved drawing. However, the law refuses to include the typeface among works of art. He's setting up a platform for his main, uh, one of the pillars of his life's works. And this is where some of you may have your memory jogged by the name of Charles Pignot, because later in 1957, he led an international team of type designers to found a type I or Association Internationale de la Typographie. And their platforms were changing technology and education in what would become A Type I's agenda, but A Type I also championed legal pathways to Peno's platform of typeface copyright protection. Peno himself united with some of the European powerhouses of type design, including John Dreyfus and Stanley Morrison, Jan van Krimpen, and Giovanni Martersteig. And of course, uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award at A Type I is called the Prix Charles Pignon. So his legacy is so broad. I just want to call out there's an excellent YouTube video of John Barry's talk where he covers the early history of A Type I. Highly recommend you watch that. But returning to Alcimete Graphique, its public publication days were truncated by World War II. This is a late issue, number 67, and it has much less color printing and tip-ins, and even a surprisingly rare ad by a competing type foundry, you know, a British monotype here. Its last issue was published in May 1939, and so by September 1939, the France and the UK were at war with Germany. In June 1940, Paris was occupied by Germany. De Berny and Pagnot's factories were pressed into service for the war effort, as type metal, unfortunately, is a similar alloy to the lead used in any kind of war apparatus. The magazine, Alcimente Graphique, did not resume publication after the war. However, the type foundry reemerged, and it reinvigorated their back stock and commissioned new typefaces, most famously from a young Swiss designer named Adrian Frutiger, the creator of the universe typeface, or univers, as we like to say it in French. 
And Universe was, of course, the first typeface released in three typesetting media, handset foundry type, monotype machine composition, and a revolutionary new typesetting technology of phototype, where a negative film of a character shape was included on a typeface glass matrix disc and exposed by stroboscopic light for paste-up films for offset lithography, usually. Debernier and Pagnot, led by Charles Pagnot, was again at the forefront of great changes in type de and design. This continued through 1972 when the foundry was purchased by Haas in Switzerland, and then subsequently later was purchased by Linotype. Now I want to circle back to Arsimete Graphique. This magazine chronicled a pivotal time in artistic in our artistic human endeavor, those years between the two world wars. I think it's a time where images in all different genres started to supersede in importance words for transmitting information and persuading people to think certain ways or desire certain products. I'm going to read some excerpts from this article of Graphisme by novelist Pierre Macorlan and illustrated by Brodovich and fascinatingly set in a monospace typewriter font, as if making it more futuristic with this choice. But I think that the article still resonates today. So I'll start. It seems to be that the main goals of human intelligence are to bear witness or to interpret the setting in which it involves. The phonograph and the camera are at the entrance of the domain of imagination. These are the latest in science. They provide new testimony to the genius of man. The symbols of our morals and our sensitivity, it's up to those who direct it to reveal this commercial poetry and this almost meta advertising. Physics will become an essential art an art of superior creation. Cities will be beautified in a way we cannot predict because tradition cannot show us the routes to be continued since still in these roads, the provisional unknown is mixed. Decorative art, the art of signs, the art of graphics, which summarize and condensed almost unpredictable anecdotal ideas and materials is an art which from now on will only find its masterpieces in spaces dedicated to advertisement. And all this still seems to be clarified, difficult at least in the domain of forms because the forms to come will not be created by the imagination of artists, but by the fatal progress of speed and the scientists, the sciences which are necessary for it. I think of AI when I read that last passage there. So in conclusion, it has been an absolute delight to revisit my understanding of the work of Arsimete Graphique because I wrote my master's thesis on this topic about 25 years ago. And you can browse the result of that work on the Cary Graphic Arts Collections website. And uh, there is the link there. During my master's work, I spent several months capturing all the title, author, and publication data in a database. I also assigned subject headings and translated titles into English for 67 of the 68 issues, as the Cary Collection was missing just one issue of the entire run. I did this to increase the accessibility of the magazine to those who could not read French. Now, back in the year 2000, when I did all that work, we did not have the capability to digitize full issues. But since I find myself enamored once again with this content, perhaps I can put this into the photography queue now at RIT and make full issues of Asimete Graphique accessible on RIT's digital repository of digitalcollections.rit.edu. Like this amazing bifer specimen which tells everyone to employ words which sparkle.
Now, I have to warn you, digitizing over 60 magazines takes some time, so keep watching our website. Also, please check worldcat.org because I can see in the New York City area alone that the libraries of Columbia, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Grolier Club have issues of Asimete Graphique. I just did a quick search and Hathi Trust also appears to have issues 1 through 12 digitized on their site. I also want to point out that Letterform Archive has some digitized Deberni and Pagnot specimens. And of course, if you want to dive deeper, there are strong digital revivals of Debernier Peño typefaces that you could purchase, like these from P22 with their version of Bifer. Um, Tipo Fondrerie has a wonderful revival of Siri 16, which is a, a Debernier and Peño typeface. And of course, Linotype, which owns the rights of Debernier and Peño's catalog, they have a few um, revivals, especially of Le Peño. So I think that's where I'd like to end today. Um, I want to say merci to everyone. I still am fascinated by this topic. Uh, I've always been looking for the metal version of Bifur in my travels, and I have never found Bifur in metal letterpress type, but I have recently uh, become the owner of the Bifur Wood Type Revival, which was a collaboration between Wood Type Customs in Romania and P22 Type Foundry. So I'll keep printing this and I hope if anybody finds some uh, Bifur Foundry Type, they'll let me know, okay? Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Amelia. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, I will echo if, if anyone out there knows um, how uh, to get your hands on on some metal by sure. Uh, please, please let Amelia know. Um, <laughs> I will um, encourage folks if you have questions. We have a few minutes to to take questions. Send them through the Q and A, not the chat. They might get lost in the, all of the applause that I'm seeing in the chat. So definitely send them in uh, via the Q and A so we can see them. Um, Amelia, you and I uh, spoke about this uh, right before we we um, opened the event, and you ended on that. Would you uh, be able to to walk us through the websites just to give folks a sense of how the website navigation works to kind of give them a, a, an extra incentive to go and look? Absolutely. Thanks for giving me that opportunity, and I will share my um, screen here. So we have to set the tone. In the year 1999-2000, um, I was using a Microsoft Access database to do this capture. And so there was an old website that was once on the Carries website that had all of these, that, that old Access database. But um, I worked with a, one of our programmers here at RIT to translate this to a Drupal site. So I'm very grateful. And on this site, there is a there's a history of Debernay and Peño as well, and that's essentially just the the text of my um, master's thesis, which you can also download different places. But the real thing that was the product of the of the thesis was this database, where I wanted to be able to uh, click on different art different issues and see all the content of it. So I'll just Take this one here, number 53 from uh, 1936. So you can see very quickly kind of a table of contents. And then if you were um, wanted to dial in and see a little bit more about that, um, let's see, we'll do... something here, that's where you can get into the meat of the database and see a title, a translation, and then um, any kind of keywords. So of course, that's the premise of all good uh, cataloging and library science where you link these topics together so somebody can explore more. And so for instance, um, I'll go to like embossing and see where that brings me up. So embossing appears to be a trait that was used over and over again to show off the various print samples that were in Asimete Graphique. Or 
I was tooling around the database recently and just reacquainting myself with the content. And I have to go back and find this article because it looks so good. Um, I was like, oh, did you know, it's the period of the new typography. So I wonder if they published anything on Jan Chikold. Um, and so we'll just give it a minute here. Jan Chikold. And there actually was an article here saying, what is the new typography and what does it want? <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's all kinds of really interesting content that I, I want to revise. I want to revisit, and I think by doing some digitization, we could get really good images and um, again help for the accessibility of this magazine, which I I really feel not only talked about typography and graphic design, but also printing, um, book collecting, and and um, an amazing part of what people were seeing in that period that we kind of idolize right now in art history, especially. So everybody can uh, take a trip through our cimetière graphique that way, and at least use it to, to kind of support your studies if you're interested in that period. Definitely, definitely. And thank you for, for putting that work out there. I think it's clearly like for not just researchers, but I think for the general public in the graphic design space or design space in general is 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 fascinating to be able to go through the these documents um, to really kind of get a sense of the context and the time. I, I know that um, um, as, as you just demonstrated, there's there's amazing resources that they carry that folks should be aware of and, and be able to um, to click through and, and, and just know about them in, in the future research. So, um, Another great reason to have lectures like this to kind of expand. And I definitely will give a, a plug, as you mentioned, to a letter from Archive that's done a fantastic job of, of getting a, a lot of the material that they have in their collection digitized available to the public. Certainly the run of emigre, which makes me definitely think of like the relationship between um, um, Ars and Mithir, um as a, as a, you know, as a promotional tool for a type foundry. And then of course, um, a conversation about the scene of, of what's happening. So um, I wanted to, to maybe use that as, as a way to ask this question in terms of the uh, how common uh, were publications like this during the time for founders to have. I know later on um, there are, but um, you know, Monotype had one, certainly I just mentioned uh, Emigre, UNLC from ITC, but how common was it for a type foundry to start its own magazine too, outside of just promotional? Yeah, and I don't think it, it was so common. The one you're talking about from British Monotype is Monotype Recorder, which was publishing around that time period as well. Um, the 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 two benchmark design magazines that I looked at during this time period were not published by type foundries, but the one was um, Gebrosch Graphique. Gebrosch Graphique is a German uh, publication that was publishing the same time as our Cimetier Graphique. We now know them as Novum, Novum Gebrosch Graphique. So they're still in business in some way. So they were a graphic arts commentary magazine. And there was another... Um, magazine called The Studio from London. And that was also kind of in the same par as as Alcimite Graphique. And in fact, if you do ever get your hands on all of those issues from the same time period, they're all printing in the same format. So they're all the same size. And for reference, I have one here. So you can see it's about like a, a nine by 12 in inches here. So I think that was a function of you know, what was capable and with the printing presses at the time and the fast uh, production. But I can't think of, um, I can't think of regular house organs from a type foundry, um, even, even in America during that time. I'm thinking of, you know, the, the predominant foundries would be, would be ATF at that time, American type founders. And while there is some evidence, I can't think of, they were really not a, they were not advertising different kinds of topics related to type and graphic arts. They were really just trying to sell their, their typefaces. Mm -hmm. Jerry Kelly mentions uh, in the chat, Klingspor. Ah, Klingspor. Thank you, Jerry. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, th I think like as, as a standalone, I mean, there's the inland print. I mean, I think like what, what, at least to my understanding, my, 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 um, I would say like relatively um, thin, thin area of knowledge around this, like the, there were trade publications, but for a founder to do essentially a trade publication and a promo tool, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing, especially mm -hmm. ATF being like the dominant American one. I don't think that they did anything in, until quite, quite later. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, one of the areas I think that really attracted me to this, and I mentioned it was this, liaison and this relationship with Melbert B. Carey Jr., whose firm was Continental Type Founders, and they imported metal types from Europe to the United States. So they had a relationship with Klingspor, um, Nibiolo, Debrini and Peño, and Caslon foundries, and milled the type to American Hype High and imported it. And so in, in the Melbourne B. Carey collection, there's a lot of um, publications of advertisements for these typefaces, but they really are ads and brochures and pamphlets to get you to buy it. But uh, thank you, Jerry Kelly, for the, the Klingspor. I think that's a great example of a calendar, which is a, a publication that you would take in your pocket, like a pocket calendar, but they all were printed with types from the foundry, the German foundry Klingspor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting too that you mentioned um Garbausch Grafik because it's um I was flip flipping through some of the issues from I'm trying to remember like where or maybe the 30s or so. Um roughly the 30s. I I think our collection goes back into the very late 20s, but um this idea of piracy, which was was definitely like a a, a hot topic for a long, long time in, in type foundry communities, you know, for, for as long as type I think yeah. could be made. Right. Or like this is yep very much the same and and certainly as technology improved copying uh type became easier and easier so this idea of copy um copy protection copywriting and 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 copy piracy was was type piracy was was always a common thing and i remember um it's funny that like um uh i guess it was uh Charles Peignot is is kind of calling out um, even the Gabashkrafi kind of nameplate of oh, so yeah. looking like Bifur, and like um, what's it called? Um, Gabashkrafi had a had a series, uh, kind of a, a running column of like people copying other designers, and and they would call out uh, and they would show side by side. Here's the original. Here's the pirated version of kind of graphic design. So it was this like very funny kind of space of. Um, of loops and then certainly um another link to um we, we just like talked about this the foundry kind of produced uh magazines unlc itc is like the first issue carried i think in line with like the ati5 movement of copyright protection um aaron burns i think was writing this big manifesto about um advocating at least in the united states for copyright protection from mm -hmm. uh, of typefaces which was still not something that could be achieved <laughs> <laughs> right and um of course uh, even with foundry type you could buy the specimens and they were limiting the number of characters that they were publishing so that you couldn't get a direct copy but a type foundry could purchase a font of whatever typeface and then produce some kind of electrotype mold so you could essentially uh, get a metal mold around the the original foundry type and then start pirating it too. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a, a medium that, like today, even with our digital technology, could very easily be um, copied and unauthorized copies could get out there. Yeah, there's definitely like, uh, I think, you know, just in terms of, of type and and i think maybe even the framing um be fascinating to kind of read charles's like piece a little closer because there's also this idea of inspiration you know i think in, in type it could be if it's exactly identical i think that then brings up questions of piracy and kind of authorships so if there's like the zeitgeisty kind of thing of 1920s 1930s kind of geometric modular kind of spaces that's it's hard to i mean inspiration around the time and the fashion certainly kind of um so it's interesting kind of to, to talk about this idea of how does one take inspiration and then do your own version of the inspiration of a typeface because formal moves are, are hard to 
own you know it's like if it's a circle it's a little hard to hard to claim that as a design right uh, that yeah you're originated. but this is it's a long-standing like tension in, in design and type design for sure mm -hmm. well and you know by for especially by for by for um in the sales um marketing promotional type specimens and that that uh kind of like manifesto that cassandra produced and the things that that Peñol wrote about, it really was, um, it was some, it was a typeface that was only made possible through a mechanical mean. So a drafts person could draw a line perfectly, of course, you know, very high, tra highly trained people could do that, but to cut the, the punches and the, make the molds for that, they really needed uh, a machine to do that kind of work. So, so again, could you really argue that it's just a bunch of, of lines and squares and circles or triangles, right, um, to be a new design? But it, it's it's fascinating to me that we see Bifur so much even today. Like, for instance, um, the poster house just had an Art Deco uh, exhibition and the entire title wall was all plastered in, you know, uh, Bifur type. So it, it is still very much in use. Um, and I, what is the sanctioned version of, of the digital? It's, uh, I think one of the best is P22 by fur, and I'm sure there's others. Yeah, yeah, P22 does a great job of, of, of especially kind of these key classic kind of um, standout typefaces that have been maybe not uh, perfectly digitized. Certainly something like that requires like precision of, 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 of design and execution. One other thing I was curious about as you were talking about in terms of the distribution of of and kind of the circulation of magazines like that um, was was something like that, um, I guess, broad enough where it could be on a newsstand or was this something definitely a little bit more kind of closer cir circle of, of people who would get it? I think um, from what I was able to ascertain and reading about the history of the magazine in a lot of French sources, um, they had a circulation at their height of about 4,000, which is very broad. Um, and I think a lot of them were subscription based. So if you, you know, were very keyed into that, it was, it went directly to you. Not sure if it went to the newsstand, I would hope so. You know, speaking of this, this company that has such a huge market share in, um, advertising and type and, no doubt other things on the newsstand would be printed with DeBernay and Peño types. So I, I kind of think it would have been. The one thing um, that I, I, I love to reference in the collection at RIT is that that collection went straight to Melbourne B. Carey Jr. So the first, I think, 20 or so um, issues of it were bound by like a, a book binder that but that uh, Carrie had employed. So we know they're from him. And those issues that went straight to Carrie in New York City, they have a, a summary sheet of some uh, of the content in English. So I don't know if they did the same with Spanish and Italian and German, but it would likely be. I mean, if they were if they were just giving a summary, to get your English readers um, some kind of translation, maybe that was happening too, and they were they were shipping them all over Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's it's I think it's a, it's definitely probably one of the reasons why it's a little harder to find in the states, just because of the 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 language. Um, I mean, I think a lot of stuff did come through. I mean, there's Italian material, and and, and as you mentioned, like uh, places like Continental were importing a lot of type with with um, the respective kind of promotional material. So so there's definitely, I've seen copies in graphic designers collections that we've kind of inherited here and there. Folks who were active in the mid century, kind of late, uh, you know, mid century, 60s, 70s, they are personal collections certainly had a few issues of these so they were either getting them from travels to Europe or, or getting them here so they were definitely known um, in the states um, there was a question earlier when you were mentioning the 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 missing issue um, Nina Schneider asked if, if Carrie was able to 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 get that missing issue yeah it was issue 38 um, and we did acquire it later on so it doesn't appear in the database uh, of the translations because by then I had moved on to other projects um, so I could do the work. <laughs> I will do the work someday. 
for someone who wants but, to. And that's right. another thing is, you know, like in the year 2000, when I was doing this work, um, because I had, I can speak and read French, we didn't have these tools, Google Translate. So, you know, um, I think that it, the content is much more accessible today with the, the digital translation tools that are not perfect, but at least will get you the gist of what, what is uh, you're reading there. So maybe it wasn't necessary. It was necessary at the time. It might not be so much today. Right. Um, Nina also had another question. Um, I'll, I'll read the, cause it, it, it thanks you. Thanks Amelia. This is brilliant. Um, how many of these faces, um, I'm presuming uh, Du Bernier-Pinot's faces, uh, can be found in the Carey collection? Do you have a complete collection? Oh, of the typefaces or the magazine? The typefaces. Yeah. Typefaces. Um, from what I understand in our collection of metal type, which is about 1,800 different typefaces, we only have Peignot. We only have the typeface Peignot. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Um, and that's, we did not get any of Melbert Carey's type, uh, by then when he had passed in 1941, his wife was still alive for, um, a good 20 years. And so any of those typographic collections would have been dispersed during her lifetime. Um, and the Carey collection didn't come until 1969 to RIT. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately we did not get, uh, the actual type, but we did get a lot of the marketing material in archival collections for continental type founders. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's it's pretty common just given the scale, scope, and like even just the weight um, of, of, of that material and how um, most offices would, would keep the um, the promotional material the, and, and not the actual kind of type. So yeah, it's it's definitely like a hard, a hard thing. But their their type is out there. I mean, like for myself, like you mentioned, like I haven't seen a metal uh buy here in, in, in person. Um I'm very curious to to see I know terrain only through specimen books. I mean I've I've known like the Pino slash terrain and I've been very curious to see um physical copies of, of that type base, which is um Still. We all need to get to France and go to like the Musée Musée de l'Imprimerie in Lyon and, and, and see it there. Yeah. I'm sure they have some and those great faces like uh, anything by Marcel Jacquinot. Those are just fantastic, like 1950s and 60s faces. Yeah, Someday. and Lori, yeah, Lori mentioned Marcel Jacquinot. I definitely will, will echo that for folks um, listening. Um, to, to check out Marcel's work as a typeface designer, also as a graphic designer. Fantastic, fantastic work. Very, very interesting, very unusual. Um, there is a, a French um, teacher, professor, historian, uh, Michel Vlasikov, um, who's done a great job of writing about um, kind of the mid-century French uh, scene and, and type scene. He's done a few books on, on, on the subject. He did actually um a book on futura oh. um, but he yeah. is he's definitely uh, a researcher uh of marcel jacquinot um and and he's collected a, a, a pretty significant material i know he was working on a book and and, and exhibitions pre-pandemic i'm not sure what stage that's at but uh, michelle um is a fantastic researcher so yeah folks if uh, and thank you amelia for putting the name in, in the in the chat um check out his work his his really really fantastic um prolific graphic designer and on often did his own lettering which would turn into type and there's a question from danny um kind of related to this if you had to pick one european city it's a hard question uh if you had to pick one european city to have fun uh investigating type and print which would it be paris <laughs> no actually <laughs> i would i would go to lyon i'd go straight to lyon and i go to the musée musée de l'imprimerie there um because in the in recent years we've been doing some work and and cataloging things in our archives that carry that really focus hard in on the phototype era. And um, I just would love to see, I know that uh, Higane and Moiru, their original archives are there. So, and I can't, I can't say enough how important that phototype era is to our digital era. And I think we all forget about it. We forget that type was, was negatives, not maybe this group, this group all knows, right. but but um, general population forget that type was photographed before it was digital. So, so I think I could get I could 
you know, sa satiate some of the the letterpress history that I have at that museum, but also um, dig into the phototype era too there. So that's a really hard question because, you know, typographically, like I should go, I haven't been yet. And all of you are going to say, you should go uh, to Tipoteca uh, Italiana. That could be a place that I could just lose myself in for a long, long time. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. I, I'm going, I hope, uh, to Reading this summer to the University of Reading, which is another typographic uh, epicenter. Yeah. Um, the Jane Siegel added uh, Antwerp, the Plant and Meritus Museum. Oh, that's enough. Yeah. Fantastic. And and I also will add the uh, Archivio Tipografico in, in Turin, which is another like working letterpress studio with this amazing, amazing collection. So there's stuff, there's stuff around. Paris is great for sightseeing. And I think, you know, Paris has amazing libraries and amazing collections. But for, I think this, this kind of research, uh, Lyon is, is better. And, and definitely the photo um, is such a significant transition to the digital type that um, is often uh, under, underappreciated, overlooked just because we went really quickly to quickly. digital like photo relatively speaking in the history of type typography is a shorter period but it's so important in the transition to make us have the digital typefaces that we have a lot of the production and and just it's super fascinating to see like the machines that were being built um around like the, the late 30s 40s of, of how type was made photographically um, and for those um, who are still, um, if you missed uh, Camille Weber, thank you, Camille, for for adding uh, Michelle's uh, um, uh, Michelle Vlasikov's book on, on Jacques Nau is in, is in. So he did he did make a book, which I'm really glad to see. Um, there was um, one other question um, that uh, I saw. Um, Paul Shaw had a question. He, he for the when we were talking about the. Um, plagiarism article he was saying that all those examples were not type uh they were actually illustration and and you're absolutely right they were not type um but they were illustrations in the spirit of uh bifur the bifur typefaces so yeah, yeah. I, I guess it, it was too hard to carve <laughs> it was too hard to cut with uh or make molds for that so they had to resort to an illustrative um interpretation inspired yes yeah, yeah. In Kind of yeah, um, and and we had another shout for another city, Leipzig, um, to, oh, to go and see. I the... just need to go live there for a whole year <laughs> right. and, and tour around. I have to say, um, and I see St. Brides, of course, in London. Um, last year, I was able to go to Prague, and their Museum of um, Technology has an incredible typographic uh, history exhibit. That just takes up like a room the size of a, a giant gym with all kinds of equipment and type in there. And of course, I could spend more than I had. <laughs> I could spend my entire vacation there. Yeah. Um, two two questions that um, came in. Um, one is uh, from Mark Resnick. Um, where do you see European and American Art Deco letter forms merging and where diverging? It's a trickier question, but right? like comparing the American or deco design to European design? Well, I can't say that that I have a good example of art deco American typography. I really can't. I can't. We are so late in our history to jump on to um, any kind of like sans serif metal uh, typography. Of course, there were examples in the 19th century for things in, in sans serifs um, that go back to like the poster era and in wood type and um, different kinds of gothics or plain gothics. So different kinds of very uh, angular or um, geometric sans serifs, but I can't, you're putting me on the spot, Mark, and I appreciate that. Can't think of a good example of an art deco typeface and all of you type spotters are gonna call them out and please do to help me out here. I can't think of an American thinking of that. Um, it seems like it's heavier, uh, more Broadway. present. Broadway, thank you. Avant-garde. Yeah. Avant-garde doesn't come to much, later. much later. Oh, my goodness. So, Well, so. It, it, there's also like um, novel gothic, I think, which was, I think, partially inspired by some of the work that um, um, 
um, Aaron Douglas was doing for Knopf. And I know that um, if Bruce is still here, Bruce Kenneth um, maybe can comment on um, Dwiggins um, doing some, but not not as type. I think that's that's your point. I think is a lot more lettering inspired by Deco, but just not not right. as much got made into type as as compared to your in Europe. I I think right. And and uh, thank you for Richard and um, Paul who are writing in some great typefaces that are quasi Art Deco, I would say, especially like Broadway. But uh, Paul, you're making me think of all the the great uh, lettering that Dwiggins did, like for the Vague, the issues of Vague, his uh, spoof on Vogue, and there was some really interesting Art Deco um, lettering that was in those. Mm -hmm. And then I guess Mark's um, um, follow up is in just even um, do you see differences or, or um, uh, similarities in in within lettering? Is there is there something that made European Art Deco different from American Art Deco? I mean, to me, they seem pretty intertwined and kind of influencing back and forth. But do you see something that makes them distinctly different? No, I don't think so. I can't I think can't single out a thing. I I. You know, when you think about what an amazing and huge movement it was, um, that it's it's not, of course, just French. It is it pulls over into all different parts of Europe. But I can't think of a, a way that American Art Deco is a little bit different. I'm trying to think if I I was just in Chicago um, and looking at the amazing architecture there, and of course there were buildings that were built in that time period. So I think the inclination of having a lot of frieze uh, typography or inscriptions. And I could see some Art Deco influence there, but you saw that in Europe as well. So. Yeah. It's also like um, something I'm, I'm discovering for myself, a lot of really interesting Art Deco Spanish design, like in the twenties and the thirties, kind of a different strain from the French kind of influence, but then kind of creating its own. And I think with the Catalan designers, um, during and, and after the Civil War, moving into France, kind of there's a there's a FTF foundry was very um, a happy oh, yeah. place for for the the Catalan um, uh, immigrants to 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 France, kind of settle and creating like the which I think leads potentially to some of the conversations about Graffia Latine, like the the stuff that Vox was sort of interested in, mm -hmm. kind of kind of through a pie and the, the stuff you the conventions or meetings in Lure that he was doing through kind of coming together and talking about type and, and uh, sort of influences. Uh, Joy asked the question, um, was Bifur cut as two pieces per letter to get the colors? Just kind of a technical. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think in that last slide in my talk, I have examples and I'll just share it really quick. Um, so you could kind of see the, the sorts that would be required to do the color blocks, the color breaks. Here, let me get to that here. Um, so this, this uh, wood type that was recut, and this is done by laser cutter, I believe. Uh, maybe not, I don't see any laser burns on there. It might be CNC routed. Um, you can see that you would have the, the top image, and this was not true in the metal type. It would have been the characters that had the lines in them were one sort lines had one sort however if you wanted the color like the green and the black here you had to have two sorts to make that chromatic the reason why they needed two sorts in the wood type is because the the router bits are not small enough to do um this kind of treatment efficiently uh you have to do i think two different router bits so you'd have to cut two faces but that's a little technical mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting typeface just in terms of the possibilities that are allowed kind of as a as a chromatic, certainly as as a very much intended to be used more than just one solid color. It really kind of opened up the possibilities, which existed in the wood type certainly before that, but kind of in the Nord Deco space to be able to print metal into color um, was was kind of a, a great new addition to mm -hmm. stuff. Um trying to see if there's our... Um, um, any other questions that we missed or anything that I had on my end? Um, well, I'm definitely going to go back and start looking at American Art Deco. So um, thanks for all the suggestions, everybody. 
you know, you're on the spot. I can't, I need, I need to call in my lifelines here to <laughs> set me straight. <laughs> There's a lot of folks in, in the, in the chat. They're sort of like, um, our, our extended, um, call lines. Um, I guess, um, we'll close out here. Um, Amelia, I, I wanted to, to, to thank you, um, um, tremendously for, for your insight and, and, and sharing this, this wonderful kind of story into this particular, um, unique, but certainly kind of really relevant object, uh, that, that has a lot of value in terms of that, that, um, peek into a particular space and time and certainly, uh, uh, echoing like the idea that like, um, being able to see, the writing of the time contemporaneous to to the design and seeing like the the way things were discussed and also seeing um a lot of the uh, material in in situ kind of in in the street which if you look at the magazines from the 40s 50s 60s from from any country are fantastic resources for things that are very much in some cases long gone some posters don't survive don't exist and we might have just a snip uh, a snapshot or mm -hmm. just even to get a sense of scale you right. know how to reuse so amazing amazing do check out uh carrie's collection um uh, thank you for the work you've done on, on getting the material to the web and and we hope to see more of that across the world so um be in touch everyone amelia thank you again uh, for for being here and sharing this insight and uh folks uh, we will see you at other talks but thanks again amelia thank you so much and thanks everyone for participating see you in rochester in the summer perhaps <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.